What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Bryant, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young, long-time assistant coach with a wealth of experience, a bright basketball mind, an excellent talent evaluator, a tremendous teacher, and a former professional basketball player, a Hall of Famer, a future head coach in this business in my eyes. I've watched over the last year during the pandemic, and she's a Dillon, Montana native, Mandy Carver. Now, before we even bring on and talk about her resume a little bit, uh, she graduated. She played four outstanding years at Idaho State University, where, uh, like I said, had a Hall of Fame career. She left there as an all-time leading scorer and rebounder in school history, named one of the top 25 players ever to come out of that conference. Um, you know, 2002 to 2009, she played professionally, uh, including the Detroit Shock, the WNBA, and various teams overseas. So, she had a lot of travel time over in Europe, but she had a chance to play professionally, seven-year career. Uh, came home, uh, decided to, um, you know, take a probably a sabbatical for a year just to rest up and you know, get a chance to see family and friends. And, and actually, when she we talked about it, uh, followed her brother. Uh, she played football as a freshman and uh, had a chance to play for a national championship, won a national championship. Um, and then uh, decided to probably get into something she's always loved. And I did a little bit digging. Uh, basketball has always been her passion. Uh, she jumps right in. She's coaching uh, one year at Cal State Bakersfield, uh, where she was an assistant coach and recruiting coordinator. And then she goes to San Jose State for two more years in the same position, uh, you know, as assistant coach and uh, recruiting coordinator. And then she ends up in Fresno State. She spent just completed her seventh year, uh, two as an assistant coach, and then her uh, last five years, uh, as the associate head coach and also the recruiting coordinator. Now, I want to welcome to the show. This is a young lady that I actually watched. You know, you listen, uh, questions we talk about on different Zooms uh, over in the last year, and I'm excited to try to get her on to my show. Welcome to the show, Mandy. How's everything? Thank you so much. Appreciate that intro. That was that was nice. I like that. <laughs> well, look, man, we, we came here to get unmasked. That's what this show is about. Uh, kind of find out some things about you and, and and about the business as well. And one of the first questions that I that I always ask is, there's no handbook to being a college coach. So you went from being an outstanding college basketball player, a professional basketball player. Now you want to get into coaching, but there's no handbook to this. Um, I tell say that all the time. Tell me about the first day, first week, first month. You know. Either one of them that when things are done with human resources or orientation, especially when no one gives you direction in this business, it's like, figure it out. T tell me what that was like, whether it was at Bakersfield when you first went or, you know, any one of the places, but talk about that. Um, I, I want to start with the interview process. So for me, the interview process, um, because I hadn't been in college coaching, um, the person I, the, the head coach that I interviewed with, um, you know, I came out to California, I did the interview and I had to put the head coach through a workout. And, you know, I was, um, I, I didn't know, like, do I make him finish the missed shot? Yes, I do. And then I was like, you need to go harder. So um, it was kind of awkward, but I, I felt like in that moment I needed to show like how I would put a student athlete through a workout. Um, and he didn't quite finish the workout. He didn't make it through. So I felt like that was, that was pretty good. Um, <laughs> pretty good during the interview process. I think getting into the job, um, no one told me that you have like paperwork and office work and you're on your computer doing all these forms and emails. And I had no idea. I was like, I'm going to be a basketball coach. Like we're going to play the games. We're going to do the practice. I'm going to do workouts. I'm going to watch film. I just, I had no idea no idea that there was like this whole office side. Um, and I think that, that people probably don't understand that aspect of it. I think um, I get 
really offended. Um, you know, out in public, people are like, oh, what do you do? And I'm like, I'm a college basketball coach. And they're like, full time? Yeah, full time. It's like 24 seven. It is 365. We don't get holidays. We don't get vacations. Like our phones are always on. We are always available. And it is like a, a consuming, demanding, um, high energy, intense, intense job that uh, nothing anyone could have told me would have prepared me for. I don't think, I don't think I would have believed them either. I needed to just experience it for myself and kind of find my way, kind of fumbling in the dark through the whole thing. I mean, it's, I'm glad you said that. I'm going to come back to that one because that's, that's interesting that people don't know that. That question comes back up a little bit, uh, what, what you were just talking about, actually very soon as well. What, what was your, you know, and I'm going to ask this because people, you, you talked about it, recruiting. It is the lifeline of college athletics. You can't, it, it's, it's, you can't, you have to be able to recruit good players. You have to be able to recruit good people. And at the same time, you got to recruit the people who are good students. And good students doesn't always mean they have to be an A student or they have to be a B student. But it has to be someone who cares about their academics, who cares about going to class. Don't, that's the thing, you know, you know, care about getting that degree. That, that, that's the most important thing. Talk about your best and worst recruiting stories you may have had over the years. And, 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 and like, you know, it, it comes in different forms. So whatever answer you have, talk about your best and worst recruiting story. Um, gosh, I, I absolutely love, love recruiting. I, um, and I think that's why I've had a lot of success because I enjoy it. I don't look at it as like, I got to fly out here. I got to go to this game. I got to go meet this kid. I got to talk to this kid on the phone. I, I absolutely love all of that. I love talking to these kids and getting to know them and getting to know their story and what motivates them, what drives them. I feel like it keeps me young too. Like, you know, getting to, um, I, I feel like I learn something new when I'm talking to these kids all the time, like some, you know, some new words or there's a new show or this. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. I get to like, I feel like kind of, I get to stay in that college atmosphere a little bit. And I love that. I love, I love how that is. And I also love, um, you know, being able to, to change these kids' lives. And a lot of times I don't think they see it or they know it. Um, they, uh, they can't even envision or dream that big, but because I've, I've been in this and basketball changed my life, I feel like I can see it for them. And that really motivates me in the recruiting process. Um, I think probably one of the the toughest things is when you don't get kids or you lose them in conference in the same conference. And that just like crushes you. Cause then you got to see them for four to five years and you're just like, mm, no, mm -mm, don't like that. Um, but one of the, the hardest things I think that, that I was early on in my career at, at San Jose state, uh, recruited a kid that was a non-qualifier. I came up with this entire plan, um, to get her eligible her entire senior year. Uh, I was working with her and, and kind of her, her, her parents a little bit and uh, the counselor at the school. Um, and then it came down to the end of, of the year and um, the counselor kind of told her something different than what I had told her. Um, and I hadn't developed the relationship enough for everyone to trust me in the process. So, um, she took the counselor's advice because that was someone she trusted more and she ended up not being eligible and having to not qualify and, and sit out her freshman year. And that was kind of a big lesson for me in um, trust. So throughout the recruiting process, you've got to develop that relationship. You've got to have that trust um, or it doesn't matter. They can come here. They could be the greatest athlete. And if they don't trust, even back when the relationship starts, it's not going to work. Um, there's always going to be some doubt. There's always going to be some hesitancy. There's, there's going to be something. So I think learning that early in my career um, has helped me a lot developing and learning how to develop that trust um, in the recruiting process and taking it through the playing career. I'm, the, I'm also, you say that because you keep, you use the words learning because it's, recruiting is not an exact science. So you're always learning. You have to create your own niche. 
So I, I like a lot of those things from an educational standpoint of doing, telling these, these younger coaches, like, I mean, you figure it out on your own, but, and, and you are your own person. So I actually love that answer. You mentioned something in the first question. You talked about, um, you know, how full-time of job. People do ask that question, like, when is your off season? There is no off season. Mm -hmm. But what did you have to sacrifice to achieve your current level of success? Because people don't understand, like, you talked about it. It's, you know, 12, 15, 18-hour days. Um, you know, even when you go home, you're still working. Uh, you still got to make calls. You might be watching film. Um, you don't get a chance to spend time with family. You don't get those same vacations. You don't get to go to the weddings. A lot of stuff. But, like, what did you have to sacrifice to achieve your current level of success? I, I think everything. Like, I, I look at myself as um, to, to get to where I am and, and how I got here, I've been very selfish. I've had to pick me um, at, well, like 99% of the time, you know, like you said, like I'm, I'm missing, I haven't had Thanksgiving with my family in like 20 some years like that. Like, what's that? Like, I just know that's not, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, my, my baby brother, he, he and his wife just had a baby. I haven't, I haven't got to meet the baby yet, you know, for various reasons. Um, my other brother, they, they have a one-year-old. I, I, barely know that kid, you know, I've, I've seen her one time. Um, so there's, there's that, like, it's, it's, I'm choosing myself, I'm choosing to make an impact in these young kids lives. And that unfortunately takes precedent over my own, my own family, my own relationships, my own friendships. Um, you know, my poor dogs, that's, that's about it. That's all I got. I got two dogs that they're happy to see me. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it's a huge sacrifice and, um, I don't regret any of it. I think, you know, my path has, has taken me in a different direction where, you know, it, it may take me a little bit longer to, to have a family, but I, I feel like I'm making an impact and it's something that's really important to me. Um, but, you know, I, I, I know my family and friends, they, they struggle sometimes. They don't really understand it. They don't get it. Um, you know, that, that part has been hard, but again, I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't give it up, you know, and I, I think with the, the pandemic this last year, a lot of people got out of coaching because they finally had a time to pause. They had, they, they were like, wow, I have all this time. I got to be with my family and my friends and um, it was eye-opening, I think, to a lot of people. I think it's it's changed our business a little bit where now, um, you know, people have always talked about work-life balance and what that looks like and what that means. But now that people have experienced that, I think it's 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 changed it a little bit. And, and hopefully moving forward, it's not like you said, the 12 to 15 hour days. It's maybe more like eight to 10, <laughs> you know, a little more normal. <laughs> on that um I, I hope it does go back to normal because you know like it's it's you know the, the pandemic probably did wake some people up like you said people stepping outside the business and you know they say yo i got name like i always used to say everyone says it in the business oh i'm living the dream but then once the pandemic hit it was like oh i tell you that's i'm living life now like you you have a life and like wow this is what life is like outside of basketball so I truly understand what you're saying. Um, scouting reports. Uh, and and, I, and that's, that's a huge part of being successful. Um, people don't understand how much time goes into doing an individual scout report. You can always tell who scouted is, who's on the sidelines, jumping, jumping up and down, most energetic. Um, you know, and, and guys have started doing it, scouts in different ways now. Like, you know, every, people share responsibility. But before you could always tell who scouted was, and you could give like you're giving the head coach information. This is what I think. This is what I see. The ultimate come up with the ultimate game plan, and there's always that one person on the scout who's struggling from shooting. You tell coach, coach they're struggling from shooting. I don't know if the coaches heard it, the players heard it. They think struggling means they can't shoot. Well, that one person comes in, makes the first three. All right, coach is fine with it. 
makes the second three. Coach is turning at you saying, I thought you said they couldn't shoot. Coach, I never said that. <laughs> but you, you know how that look is. But talk about your best and worst scout reports you may have had over the over your time in coaching or just what you think about scout reports in general. Um, I think that is one of the best parts of being an assistant coach. Uh, it is where you get to um, implement your thoughts, your ideas, your game plans, your, your crazy, like I, I always have like one crazy thing, like let's uh, one time trap this player just randomly, like in the third quarter. So they, they can't, they think that we adjusted at halftime. You know, I, I have some, some crazy now. Do we always do them? No. Um, but that's also my learning process and my um, my way of kind of throwing stuff out there and see like if it sticks, if it works, you know, and that's the head coach's job to filter it. And so, you know, I, I'm like idea, 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 solution, solution, you know, just coming back with more. Um, and it's good because that's a filter. So then when I am a head coach, then I can be like, yeah, remember that one time I thought we should do this? Like, what was I thinking? Um, <laughs> now, uh, with with scouting reports, um, I think anytime there's a loss that, that, you know, you did the scout and it was just like a, a close game, or maybe they did something, um, you know, I, a lot of times it's a best guess, right? Like you're trying to say, okay, these are like maybe the three to five things that they're going to do against us. And it's like thing 10 that you knew they did, but you didn't prepare, prepare for it. Cause it was like, they did it three times in the previous game. And then against you, they do the whole thing. And people are looking at you like, did you even know they were going to do this? And you're like, I did, but we can't prepare for 25 things. We got to do like, you know, the top three to five. I think that's, those are the worst. Like you have, you're sitting there. It's like the second quarter and you have this sinking feeling in your stomach. Like, oh, halftime is going to be rough because <laughs> going to be like, uh, did you not know they were going to do that? Yeah, I did. But again, we can't, we can't prepare for anything. Um, and I think the, the, the best games are the ones that in the scouting process that the team like executes the game plan to perfection. And you're sitting there totally different feeling. You're like, I'm kind of a genius. Yep. You know, you're already like patting yourself on the back because <laughs> you know, you, you've got to in those moments, but I think the hardest part, um, and, and I didn't feel this way as a player. I feel this way as a coach, like you celebrate the wins for about 15 seconds, right? Like the, the, the game ends and you're like, whoo, now on to the next one, you know, like, you're like, yay, we won. All right, great. High fives all around happy. And then you're like, all right, on to the next one. Like, switch the gear preparation mode. Um, and I think with the losses again, uh, in coaching, you, you sit with that, like, Oh man, there, <laughs> there've been sometimes I'm like, wow, I'm so bad at my job. I'm going to start Googling professions. What else could I do? Like what else, what like washed up college coach? What, <laughs> what am I qualified to do? Because you just, you, you feel it so intensely and especially when it's been your scout, like you are so invested and so like, oh, it just, it gets you. And, and <laughs> those ones, I, I mean, as a player, I was upset when we lost. I felt it was my fault. I could have scored more, defended better, you know, done, done several things, but it, it, it didn't hit me the way it does as a coach. And, oh, those are, those are rough. I, the, again, no one could have prepared me for that. Like, and I think if you're a competitive person, you probably should feel that way a little bit, right? Like, you know, if you care about what you're doing and you want to do a good job, you maybe should feel like that. You are hundred percent correct. They, they do. They, they linger with you. Uh, you said wins 15 seconds. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Losses. You like, you can't sleep. You're trying to figure out what do we do wrong? Trust me. I, I, I feel you a hundred percent on that. Yeah. Um, What's the biggest challenge you think you've experienced since you've been a college coach? Uh, definitely adjusting as the, the times change, the players change, the needs change. Um, you know, like how I was coached is how you, you, you can't coach like how I, like my generation can't do it. The kids will not, will not respond. They won't 
they won't stand for it, um, you know, and trying to figure out how to adapt with the times. I think that's been really challenging. I think um, this next phase of the, the name, image, and likeness bill passing, where kids are now going to be able to make money um, off of their name, image, and likeness, they can, they can get paid for pretty much anything. I think that's going to be kind of tricky to navigate through, and um, there's going to be some hard discussions within teams with with players and and trying to figure out how how that fits in because now um, we're no longer amateurs. I think at that point we're kind of you know we're we're, we're heading into the professional level, and there's going to be a, a different level of expectation. There's going to be a lot more stress and, and pressure on these kids that are already struggling to navigate this world with social media and all of the, the things that come with that and things that come with being young and, and in a highly visible sport. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to kind of, again, roll with that next wave of, of, of challenges. A great answer. I mean, man, I love it. I mean, you're dropping some, knowledge over here on, on people. I hope they, they, uh, they pay attention to a lot of this. Um, do you ever find that there are things about you that people might misunderstand? Like what I like, you might go out on the road, you might not be a talkative person when you're recruited, or you're a competitive person by nature from being a player and, you know, doing the game, you might, you know, might, look, might be a little bit more passionate, but like, is there anything that people might misunderstand about you and what are they? I'm so nice. And I think people just don't think I am. I know I have, I have one of those faces, right? It's like, I may, I may react, but like, it's not how I feel or I think, but my face may show something and people assume that, but I'm very nice. And I'm, I, I think I'm pretty funny too. So, um, (laughs) and, uh, I am very talkative. So I like, if, if someone sits next to me in recruiting, I'm just gonna like, chat you up and down and like you may not want to sit there if you just want to watch the game like I want to talk I want to like know what you think and you know are you recruiting that player and I I think a lot of times like we think everything's like a big secret like why why can't we just all share and we only get better if like we all share and tell like tell it like it is if you're just holding on to the greatest thing and you know like maybe you have the greatest drill like let's go share it. Maybe we can tweak it, make it better. And that's the only way we're all going to evolve and get better. Um, and I think, uh, men's coaches do such a good job of like sharing and networking and helping each other and helping each other grow. Um, that is my goal, um, in the women's coaching profession to help and mentor as many, um, young people that want to, to get into this profession and all the, all the knowledge I have, like, here it is like this is it I'm only going to get better if I give it all away like me keeping it is not helping myself or anyone else um so again in recruiting I'm I'm just like I'm laying it all out there if if you're sitting down next to me like hold on because it's going to be a <laughs> a bit of a conversation awesome I mean I, I know people like that and they can still get that work done some people like come in and like, I gotta focus I gotta focus but why can't you do both? Like you should be able to do both, but that's how some people are. I got to concentrate. Yeah. Um, we're all educators in this business. I mean, we always talk about to our players, like it's the, the basketball court is like a classroom. So you always educate them. Um, you know, whether it's in the film room or on the basketball court, but I'm going to ask you this question. What do you try to teach your young players, your players in general, um, besides basketball? What do you educate them on? Oh man, everything. I try to relate everything back to life or, you know, like if you can get through this hard time, uh, you know, when you have kids and and you're broke, you're going to be, you're going to be fine. If you can, you know, fix your body language when we're trying to coach you, correct you, when you have a job and your boss is unhappy, like you're going to be so thankful. Um, you know, if, if you can get through some of these hard things and, and trying to make them see, you know, the, the, the payoff and why some of this stuff, cause a lot of it is like trivial and small and they're like, that's dumb, but 
no, it, it's not. It's really, it's, it's trying to help you so that when you're an adult, like a full-fledged adult, like they're like half adults when they're with us, but like when you're like really on your own, like you're not getting that, that scholarship check anymore that you, you can function and you can look back and be like, I can do anything because I made it through college basketball. You know, I can shoot for the moon basically. Um, and I think trying to just talk to them about like the world that they're living in and, and, you know, making sure that they're focusing on their mental health and that they are focusing on, you know, understanding how the world is changing and the social issues and social justice and making sure that they, they are educated as much as possible in, in all of those, those areas. Um, and that they're having fun too. That, that, I mean, we're playing a sport, like it, it needs to be fun. Like <laughs> it's a game. Like you got to remember that at the end of the day. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. That, that is a hundred percent true. Um, like, I, like I said, I, I think you're going to have your own program one day. I, I think you're that good. Um, if, if you had a chance to sit down and it, it's, this can be hard because it's a hard number. I'm just to throw this number out here. But if you had a chance to sit down uh, for three or four hours with three or four people that you wanted to pick their mind and say what made them successful, um, you know, as, as, as a basketball coach or running their program, like who were those three or four people you would want to sit down with, talk, pick their brain? How, how did you become so successful at what you did? And remember this word successful because it's going to come up later. But who, who would those three or four people be? Um, I've been really fortunate that I've had a lot of great mentors over my career. So um, I have been able to sit with Tara Vandeveer, the head coach of Stanford, who just won a national championship, uh, and pick her brain. And I mean, that that was like, you know, going to coaching university, like have 101, 201, 301. Like, I mean, I could just listen to her talk basketball and philosophies and I mean she's she's brilliant and I think she's probably one of the best in coaching at adjustments um and just like her work ethic is like unmatched um so uh, anytime I can talk to her would would love to do it forever and ever um I'm also fortunate enough that I was mentored as a player by Pete Newell so um Pete Newell Sr. He, uh, he, I like to say he's like the inventor of the post moves. And like, uh, I mean, he worked with Shaquille O'Neal. He worked with Lisa Leslie. Like he, he did the NBA big man camp for 20 some years. Um, so I was fortunate enough to have him work with me and again, get to hear all his stories and his son, um, Pete Newell Jr. actually once when his father passed away, uh, he kind of took over my mentorship. So he's, he was like a legendary high school coach in California on the boys side. And, uh, he's continued to mentor me. He really, um, makes me think about basketball. So again, anytime I can have a, a conversation with, with him, um, because he poses some, some really interesting questions, just, you know, on, on basketball philosophies and different in, in life too. Like he will, he'll make, he'll make my brain hurt just by having those conversations, which is good. You need those people that are going to push you like that. Um, someone I would love to sit down and talk with is Don Staley. I love her fire, her competitiveness, um, her story, um, and, and how she's now one of the, the best coaches um, at the collegiate level on the women's side and how she has done it her way and, and, I mean, she still played and coached when she was at Temple. And like that kind of blows my mind, just that demand of, of being able to do that. So would love to maybe, maybe I'll try to squeeze in next to her uh, in July and just like strike up a conversation. Who knows? <laughs> and Dawn is awesome. She's in a group that uh, we have a group uh, of Philly. She actually talked about it when she was at uh, an NCAA tournament. It's, called 12 Inches Over, we're part of a whole group. So to have Don and Carol Lawson uh, in it, along with a lot of male coaches, there's a few women coaches, but uh, Don, I think, is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful voice in college athletics right now. Like, 
what she says, like people listen. We keep talking about it on the men's side. Like, like who is that person? Who is John Thompson? Who is John Cheney? You know, who is Nolan Richardson? But like, I think Don Staley's like the most powerful voice. It's interesting how that is. Um, and, and, and I have a lot of respect for her. So you definitely want to have a chance to sit down and talk with her. Trust me. She's, she, she's very good at what she does. Um, I, I like to ask this as more of an entertaining question. We don't have to use names. I, I don't even like, I don't, I, I wouldn't know who they were anyway, but what's the strangest or weirdest thing a player has done outside of the basketball court? Did you just was like, I can't even believe this person did that. Well, well, gosh, I I feel like every time I think like I've seen it all, like I uh, like put that on the list. I've seen it all. Um, I have not, and I have learned to stop saying that. Like, cause I, the minute I do that, I jinx myself, and I'm like, did that really just happen? There are there. I mean, my list is is forever and ever long. Like, and <clears throat> just some of the the, the crazy things that. That happen. I, I, like I said, I've just learned to 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 say <laughs> I have not seen it all, and I won't. I won't I, because something wild, crazy is going to happen. You know why? The team. I mean, eighteen and twenty-two year old. It's you. You you're sitting there. You're like, wow. You know, I mean, you just said like, this is really hot. Like, or. I can't believe this. Like, it, there's nothing that's ever happened like this again. Well, it does, but it's, it's interesting. Um, what, what's the biggest accomplishment that you have experienced since you have become become a college coach? Um, so last season and uh, this season, um, I think stand out the the, the most. So uh, last season. Um, when we were living in a pre-COVID world, uh, we uh, we won the Mountain West regular season uh, championship. And I'm gonna say uh, this, by the way, I was there at the Mountain West tournament. I can remember that. Well, we didn't win the tournament. We won the regular season. I know y'all won the regular season, but I was there doing that tournament. I know that. Yeah. The the tournament. We were in the championship game. We went to overtime. It ended on a controversial call. That, that was tough, that, that didn't end great. And then we didn't get postseason because of COVID. So that that all kind of just ended with a, with a bad feeling. Um, but before that, when we won the regular season, um, we had a home game to clinch the, the regular season championship um, with San Jose State, which is about two and a half hours north of us. So in-state kind of rivalry um, and we um, we had a last second play to win the game and I'm in charge of all of the late game situations. And I have this play that we have probably worked on in practice for five years at this point. And our girls are like, we're never gonna use that. Why are we always working on it? Like no one can make the pass. No one's gonna switch, blah, 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 you know? And so uh, we run the play and it is like, perfection we score we win the game crowd goes wild the whole thing um and that was I had to be calm under pressure I had to make them believe in that moment that we could score I had to draw it out I I, I mean the kid had to make the pass the kid had to make the catch and make the basket um and that I like after we go out of the timeout this is me on the bench this is because uh, I just I couldn't even I couldn't breathe and I couldn't yeah so that that was I that was a a great moment in in my coaching career um, and then I would say this season um, we again fell short in the championship game um, game ended you know unfortunate in the championship. So it's back to back years now that we have lost in the Mountain West tournament championship game, which not great, but we were able to go to the NIT. Um, we did not take our entire team to the NIT. Um, so we ended up beating Missouri in the, the round of 32 of the NIT to go to the sweet 16 of the NIT uh, with 
our bench and uh, three starters. So, I mean, kids that hadn't played more than five or six games all season. Um, so the, the way that we were able to like come together as a team, as a staff, um, gosh, I, I don't think I've ever been prouder of a group of people and like, you know, the Grinch, the heart just swells and swells. That's how I felt like (laughs) just so proud of like everyone and all of us. And especially after COVID being such a hard year, um, and, and that group of us being able to come together and and win against a SEC team, like that was huge and, and probably one of my most favorite memories. Wow, that's, that was awesome. That's awesome. Hey, that is awesome. Um, what movie or TV show title best describes your week? <laughs> best. Oh, best movie, uh, Love and Basketball. I mean, that's easy, right? Like that is, and I feel like, I mean, that movie literally, I, I, I kind of lived a little bit like the, the part in Europe where, you know, the, the coach is up there talking in a foreign language and the American looks to her teammate and like, what did he just say? And they, they, they're like, they translate it to where like, you got to score. Oh, okay, easy. <laughs> but uh, anyway, again, I love my job. I love getting to work with with young adults, and uh, that that title just kind of fits fits the day to day. Love it. I love that. What's your favorite word or phrase? Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> um th- this is like so corny, but. <laughs> um, cupcakes or muffins that just believed in miracles so uh, you know (laughs) plus I love cupcakes but like if you think about it like I try to live like that like nothing is uh absurd or too out of reach or you know like if you believe that you can do something like you can so a lot of times when you know kids say like I want to be a doctor I want to be a lawyer I want to be an architect okay if you really want to do it I will support you. I will help you every way that I can, but you've got to know, like it, you got to put in the work. Um, so that kind of, that's kind of a, a corny way of, of, of encompassing my, my philosophy. <laughs> I actually like that. I like that. Um, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, so I, before my senior year of college, again, I, I, I got to meet Pete Newell senior and I got to meet Ann Myers Drysdale who, um, played at UCLA. She's one of the best like female athletes of her generation, um, Olympian. And, uh, she was drafted to a NBA team. I think the Pacers. So, uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal person an athlete. Um, and I had this dream that I wanted to, to be a professional basketball player. And, um, she said to me, like, you're a dime a dozen, like what's special about you. You've got to find what makes you different, what your niche is going to be. And then you've got to work at that. And, uh, I mean, it's, it sounded kind of negative at the time. Um, but it was so motivating to me and, I was like, okay, right. What am, what, if I am a dime a dozen and there's a a bunch of players that are like me, how am I going to separate myself? Similarly, like coaching and and recruiting, like what makes me different from the next coach off, you know, down the road. And um, so playing wise, I was able to, I was like, okay, I'm going to focus on rebounding. I was always a pretty good rebounder. I, I could jump a little bit. I was pretty mobile. Um, And then my senior year of college, I led the nation in rebounding. And I kind of took that and have made that like my, my thing. So my niche, like I'm going to work hard. I'm going to, you know, continue to show up and be relentless, which is kind of like that rebounding, rebounding mentality, like with, with coaching, with recruiting, like uh, here I am again, here I am again, you're going to hear from me. I'm going to be the same. I'm not going away. Um, And you can trust that what you see is what you get. Like, I'm not going to be like this one day and then flip the switch and be, 
someone else tomorrow. Like, this is it. This is what you get. This is, <laughs> it's not, it's not changing. So um, I, I think that was, that helped me so much playing and now career-wise. Awesome. That is awesome. Um, and I, you said something about it where you successfully last time. And I'm going to ask you, what does success mean to you? Because so many people have different answers. Like some people get caught up in wins and losses. Some people, but, but what does success mean to you? Success for me, again, I know we're judged on wins and losses. And like, if we don't win, I don't have a job. I get that. But like you said, that is not what I, I feel like is success. Uh, to me, I want to be someone that um, these kids can count on forever. Like I, I'm, I'm not here from like recruiting you at 16 and then at 22, bye, you're not going to hear from me. No, uh, I'm not going away. You better invite me to the wedding. I better be like, I better know your kids. Uh, you know, you better, I'm going to wish you happy birthday when you turn 30, like those. <laughs> and, and I have prided myself on maintaining relationships with all the players I've coached. So I would say for about 95% of the players I've coached, I can still get in touch with them. I would, I still communicate with them, um, you know, different for each player. And, you know, maybe it's once a month or maybe it's like every other month, but I, I'm not going away. Like I'm, I'm here. This is, this is, it's not fake. It's not like, I loved you because you played basketball and you scored a lot of points. Like, nope, I like I care about you as a person and I want to see you have success and I want to support you and be your champion and help you in, in any way that I can or that you need. Um, that is how I determine success, that I am sticking to my word of like, this is this is a lifetime commitment when you play for me, like, or, or I recruit you, like, that's not going away. So, you know, that's, that is, that's what keeps me motivated. And again, no, I'm judged on the wins and losses, but that isn't the most important thing. That's great. That's great to hear. I mean, I love that. I love that answer. We you know, always talk about it. You said a lifetime. Some got, some people talk about, it's not a four year decision. It's a 40 year decision. I want to be, you know, in your life. And I think that's important. I think that is important that people know no matter what ups and downs you have in life, you're still going to be there to support them, you know, if, if they're doing the right thing. So I, I think I, I love that answer by you. Um, you're not a self-promoter. I, I, I mean, I'm listening to you now. I've heard you before. But if you had to choose three adjectives to describe yourself, which would you choose? Oh, man. Um, caring. Uh, I think that... Um, I think I'm hilarious, but you know, maybe <laughs> that's my self-promotion for my comedy tour. Um, and, uh, probably, um, I'm extremely competitive, like extremely competitive. I have to like tame the competitive part of me. Like if we're playing board games, watch out. Like I may flip, I may, I may flip the board game. If, I can't play like um, rec league or, um, you know, if there's like a staff kickball, I, I can't because no one wants to see that side of me. I will throw the ball at someone's face and it, it'll be over. So like, I have to constantly like keep that like right, kind of right at the surface because it's, you know, it's good in this profession to be competitive like that, but in life, it can kind of uh, be taken the wrong way. <laughs> I love it. I love the competitive. They don't matter. I'm throwing it at your face. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, what, what person and or event has had the most influence on your life? Oh, geez. Um, I think... My brothers have um, had such an impact on my life. I think um, I, I have two younger brothers that uh, I'm just so proud of them for all that they've been able to accomplish. And now they're both fathers and they have little girls. And I'm just so, 
so happy to see them with their daughters and um, how how good of fathers they are. And um, I think having an older sister has made them more prepared to have girls. So um, I'm uh, like they they have. I always wanted siblings and I was so happy that I got them. I wanted sisters, but I think the world knew that um, <laughs> that wouldn't have been good. So <laughs> they, they, uh, they can handle me. And uh, that, that has been a huge influence. I've always wanted to, um, you know, kind of do the right thing and be a good role model for them. Um, whether it be just in life, academically, athletically. And I think that, you know, they have pushed me to do that. And, and I'm thankful that I, I have them. Wow. Well, I'm going to ask you this. Like, um, what's the most stressful situation you think you faced like in, in this business? <sighs> I, I think you could, you could say every day is stressful. I mean, constantly making decisions with, kids best interest in mind I think that that's that's stressful uh the feeling like you know I always tell the parents like we are going to take care of your kids like like you would like you know and having that responsibility of of these kids best interest and and that their parents have like entrusted us to keep them safe and, and take care of them and watch over them and develop them as, as young people. And uh, that, that's stressful. That's a huge, to me, that's a huge responsibility because again, I'm, I'm all about keeping my word and, and what I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. And, you know, I'm not going to say we're, we're going to do all these things like that, that we sell in recruiting, right? Like, we're going to make you a better basketball player. We're going to make you a better human. We're going to make sure you graduate. We're going to help you get a job. Like those kind of things, like that is a great responsibility. And that can be a little bit stressful and overwhelming at times. Yeah, definitely can. I, I mean, you said like every day. Um, and I, I, I like to end with this question just because, I mean, you, you had a different path. You were a professional player for seven years. But like knowing what you know now, what would you tell your young self or younger self to prepare for, like uh, as an assistant? What, what, what would you what would you say? Um, I I think just again as females and on the women's side, I don't know that we talk basketball enough, and just learning the game, the terminology, the the different things. I think and I hate to like stereotype this, but I think men are, sit around and talk sports, right? Like the like guys sit around and they'll have the game on, even people that aren't in coaching, they think that they know, they're like, oh, LeBron, why, why are we using LeBron at a point forward? Why are, you know, like mm, we need to get AD the ball or, you know, what everyone has uh, an opinion we women, we don't sit around and watch. We're like, dang, LeBron looks good today. You know, like that's, like those shorts are nice. Like that's like, those are the conversations we have. And I, I wish that it would be more, um, you know, focused on, on strategy and, and the game and um, learning that because that I think would have helped me a lot sooner. Um, and, and my, um, my trajectory would have been quicker as opposed to, you know, um, I knew what I knew, but now I have I have done a better job of educating myself on, on different things like basketball wise. Uh, so I would have, I would have loved that. And the networking, networking, um, trying to get to know as many people uh, being mentored. I mean, people are willing to mentor. You just got to ask, like I've, I've been fortunate enough to mentor, you know, two to three people a year. Um, and I am more than willing to mentor anyone that wants to get into the business or just get better at it. I, I feel like I learned just as much by doing that. And um, I think you just got to ask. People don't ask. And so, you know, you're, you're kind of nervous or afraid. But that I would have I would have just been like, hi, here I am. 
teach me, talk to me, tell me all your tricks. Like, like, and I love to do that again. Like that's something I'm pretty passionate about as well. That's awesome. That, I mean, I, I love that. Like, um, I, I just listening to you. Well, look, I want to thank you again, man, for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Um, is there anything you want to leave with the viewers before we go? Um, I think just, uh, be kind to yourself. I think a lot of times we're all too hard on ourselves, especially as coaches. Like I said, I sit with those losses. I sit with the lost recruit that went to someone else in the conference. Like, gosh, that keeps me up at night. And I, I don't need more wrinkles. Like, I, <laughs> so that, that would be my, my, my parting advice. Just, just be kind to yourself, forgive yourself, um, and be open to endless possibilities. Awesome. Awesome. Well, like I said, thanks again. I appreciate you. And I want to thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe.